I used to be, and this is going to sound really braggy, but I used to be, honestly, I used to be the prettiest, cleverest girl in my class. But I was homeschooled, so. <laughs> I wasn't that academic at school, actually, but I loved philosophy, and I still love philosophy. Like, I'm always thinking about life's big questions. The other day, I was thinking, what if, all this time, it was shaggy? <laughs> I've been on a man ban. Uh, well, it's over now. I can't stress that enough. Let the dog see the rabbit. <laughs> but I was on a man ban for a year, right? And that was to reset my patterns so they didn't fancy skateboarders. <laughs> I had, like, commitment issues with guys, I would say. Not as bad as my friend Shannon, though. Oh, my God. My friend Shannon, the biggest a-hole in the room, she would identify him and be like, yeah, I love him. <laughs> she... Like, you know when you've got commitment issues and you attract other people with commitment issues because like attracts like, but you don't realise you're part of the problem? <laughs> so Shannon, one day, she decided, right, I want to go out with a good guy. I want to get married. Right, so she popped herself on Guardian Soulmates, just popped herself on. And she was still attracting hookups. So I said, well, let me have a look at your profile because I'm very emotionally intelligent. <laughs> and you what? Actually, because straight away I spotted the problem, right? So she's on Guardian Soulmates, and she hadn't written enough about herself. And I think that was problem number one. Because I think you've got to give of yourself, you've got to be a bit vulnerable. And she hadn't really written a lot. That was the first problem. Second problem was really what she'd written. <laughs> so I'll tell you what she's written, you see if you can see the problem, okay? So she'd just gone with this. In for a penny, in for a pounding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, once she set off my cousin John and she kept her coat on. <laughs> Mixed messages. <laughs> so the thing that I would do, right, when I had commitment issues, what I would do is I went through a phase where I'd go out with men, like, way younger than me. I think just because they're around, like, they're not married, they don't know any better, <laughs> and they're easier to catfish. Um, <laughs> how do you know if a man is too young for you? I'll tell you this, this is something I learned. Right, OK, you're out and about, you're on the town, and um, he just asked you to buy him a chalky milkshake. <laughs> that actually happened. <laughs> and then I went back to his. I know, I went back anyway. <laughs> <laughs> his hand soap at his flat was Jelly Baby flavoured. <laughs> Ooh, Mama got a go. <laughs> After she slept with you. <laughs> Yeah, so I want to go with older guys now, or age-appropriate, you know, like 35 to 45, big hands. <laughs> Quick show of hands. <laughs> no, <bye. laughs> Your taste changes as you get older. You know, I want someone kind, obviously. You know, I want someone funny. You know, I want someone creative, uh, but not with the truth. Um, <laughs> you know the sort of guy that, yeah, maybe he plays the guitar but he waits to be asked. <laughs> I'm very wise, actually. I've got some wisdoms. I just put them over here. <laughs> OK, tip number one. You might know this one, actually. I think quite a lot of people knew this already. But apparently, if you buy a new car, you lose half the value of the car as soon as you drive it off the forecourt and into a tree. <laughs> This is a really good tip. This is a really good tip to get out of any sort of trouble. Because I cycled into someone's car and she was like, meh, meh, meh. Um, <laughs> right, so I had this up my sleeve. Okay, so any time someone has a go at you for anything at all, this is what you do. You put your hand on their shoulder, you tilt your head to one side, that bit's optional, but it's a nice touch. <laughs> and you say, I don't think this is about me, is it? <laughs> What's going on for you at home? <laughs> Welcome to your new lives. Um, this is a really good tip at work, if you haven't done your work, right? OK, so, what's your name? Chris. Chris, what do you do? Uh, work in a bank. You work in banking? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I like money, fine. Chris, imagine... OK, this is what you do if you haven't done your work. We're going to do a role play, so you can all use this at work. Imagine we're in a bank, Monday morning. Um, Chris, you're there, I'm there, our bosses are there, right? You just say to me, have you done the reports? And this is what you all say back, if you haven't done the reports because you've been busy out being a legend, like me. <laughs> OK, go on. Have you done the reports? Um, Chris, 
Is this about us sleeping together? <laughs> and then Chris might say, we haven't slept together. And I go, exactly. <laughs> Now, one question that I get asked all the time, if you could take a pill that would make you thin, would you take it? Of course I bleed and well would. I would like to take a pill that made me six stone. Then I could eat my way back up to ten. <laughs> what a bloody brilliant weekend that would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> you see, I think there's two types of people in the world, right? And it's all to do with how they eat biscuits, right? Because... The first type of person makes a cup of tea, gets a plate out. <laughs> opens the packet of biscuits, takes one biscuit out, puts it on the plate, and eats it very daintily off the plate. Folds the packet back up, bit of sellotape over the top to keep it fresh for next month. <laughs> now, those sort of people should be executed, shouldn't they? Because The rest of us get a packet out, eat the whole fucking lot without taking the cover off, do we, really? <laughs> and consequently end up looking like me. Because I've always had a weight problem. You know, when I was a, a teenager, I remember going to see the careers mistress, and she said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to be a nurse or get married. She went, better be a nurse then. <laughs> a teenager I wasn't frightened of teenage boys but I'm terrified of them now they're a scary bunch aren't they and you know I actually have teenage nephews and one of them always has a sign on his door saying keep out like you're going in there without a flamethrower <laughs> lend me my crampons dear I'm just popping in to tackle tissue mountain um, <laughs> And, of course, the worst thing I think you can do with teenagers is try and kind of get down and speak their language. They hate that, don't they? Which is why I quite like doing it. And I actually found this out to my cost last year, right, because I went around for months going to people, would you look at that ninja over there? <laughs> that is a ninja and a half, that is, isn't it? And I found out that this was actually wrong. To my cost, outside my local park, there were two teenage boys. I went, come on, lads, look at that minja. What a blinking minja that is. <laughs> and they went, oh, for Christ's sake, it's Minga. And that's our mum. So, you know... <laughs> all these programmes on telly about women being domestic goddesses are just not true, are they? <laughs> I'd like to have a programme on telly, right, that truly represented how women actually approach the housework, right? And if I did, my programme would be called Fuck It, That'll Do. <laughs> now, I wonder, are we ever going to, as women, break the glass ceiling? I mean, I personally think when we can burp like men, that's when <laughs> we'll be equal. I do burp quite a lot, still better out than in, like Simon Cowell in a lifeboat. Um... Recently, someone said to me, well, with all that's going on in the world now, Sindhu, surely on stage you're talking more about politics. I'm not a political comic, so I said, no, why should I? And then they said, because you're a brown woman. That's very political. What? I mean, why as a brown woman can I not just care about my own shit? <laughs> why do I have to care about, well, frankly, what is your shit? <laughs> you know? And also, as a brown woman, I did my homework right up top. When I moved to this country 20-odd years ago, I applied for and got a UK passport like this. And then, and then, I married a European. Hello, two for two. <laughs> So for those of you who are floundering now, well, you snooze, you fucking lose, all right? <laughs> I don't know. But it's not that I don't think about politics and it's not that I don't worry about politics. Of course I do. When the Brexit vote happened, I called my mother, she lives in India, and I was so upset, I was crying, and I said, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, mommy, and the kids, and what about us? And my mother said, oh, just shut up. Your life could be much worse even without the Brexit, you know? 
And I said, how? She said, well, you could be dead, husband could marry the pretty lady and she could be very cruel to your kids. <laughs> and then I was like, first of all, mommy, that is very specific, all right? <laughs> and second of all, who is the pretty lady? <laughs> but I tell you what, immediately stopped thinking about politics and started thinking about my husband. I have been married for over a decade, which means for over a decade, I have been working with this man. I have been working on this man. And Apollo, I won't lie to you, I have been manipulating the shit out of this man <laughs> to make him a mildly agreeable spouse. And I'm going to die and some bitch is going to inherit that? No, 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 no. No, it's all mine. So I went and found my husband, he was reading, and I said, hey, hey, if I die all of a sudden, are you gonna get married again? And my husband said, wait, what, wait, what are we talking about? And I was like, oh my God, you're stalling. <laughs> I mean, this is a yes and no question. So I said to him, listen to me, before you make up any more lies, let me tell you the correct answer to this question. You please memorize it. First of all, if I die all of a sudden, you mourn me every single day of the week. Second of all, there is a giant picture of me in the hall. And every time you pass the picture, you stop and you do namaste to that picture. <laughs> and if the kids are around, you call them over, you gather them up and you all cry a little bit. <laughs> and then because my husband knows me very well, he said, oh yeah, fine, um, have you been talking to your mother? But here's the thing about being married a very long time, you get to know each other so well, right? I mean, my husband knows me well. I know my husband so well at this point that we can have a full-blown argument from start to finish and he's not even home. <laughs> you know? So, this year, I have been married 21 years. Thank you, thank you. Um, I know it looks like I could have been a child bride, which where I'm from, totally possible. Anyway. <laughs> Right. Anyway, so uh, 21 years. And here's what I've learned in 21 years, that to stay married and stay happy, because it's not naturally the same thing, to stay married and stay happy, what you must do is keep your focus on what is important. Keep your focus on what is important, let everything else fall away. See, I'll explain. The other day, my husband and I were having an argument, a face-to-face -face one, the one where he's actually at home. Um, so we're having an argument, and, uh, well, I mean, I say argument. The fact is, after 21 years, my husband and I don't really have arguments. We have throwdowns. <laughs> you know throwdown? Like MMA level. <laughs> Do you know what MMA is, sir? Yeah, marriage martial arts. Proper. <laughs> M -M no matter what the topic, my husband and I both always bring it for everything. Because we know that after 21 years and three kids, nobody's fucking going anywhere. <laughs> right? We are just trying to get to the end of this somehow. Been in America quite a bit the last few years. Back and forth between England and America. At a moment, I'm in New York. It's very similar. Look, New York and London are very similar. They're similar places. They are. New York is just a bigger, crazier, filthier version. Because <laughs> New York is filthy. It's filthy. It's dirty. It's dirty. It's filthy. It's, it's dirty, filthy, gross, <laughs> dirty. <laughs> it's a filthy city which is a problem for me, because I am very OCD. Like, I am super OCD, I'm a germaphobe, big time. Like, I travel a lot as a comedian, I stay in lots of different hotels and things, and uh, people always say, oh, it must be really good staying in all these different hotels all over the world. No, not for me. I travel with my own bed sheets, <laughs> pillow and pillowcase, special slippers that I only wear in hotel rooms, because I don't want hotel floor to contaminate my floor. <laughs> Every hotel room I stay in looks like an episode of Dexter. I just put plastic. <laughs> I've seen too many of those TV shows. You know those science shows where they go, we went into a hotel room and we took a swab off the mattress. 
and we found blood, skin, feces, and semen from a giraffe. <laughs> Oh my god, they let giraffes check into the Hilton. This is. <laughs> I touch nothing in a hotel room, nothing. I wipe everything down. I don't even touch the TV remote control in a hotel room. That's right, people, don't touch it. I wrap it in a shower cap. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, that's a good idea. Yes, it is! <laughs> the TV remote is the filthiest part of the room. It's filthy. Dirty. It's dirty. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why the remote controls the filthiest. A very large percentage of people that stay in hotels are single men. <laughs> Let me say that again. Single men. <laughs> Travelling alone. All alone. Men alone. <laughs> alone, all alone. Alone, single men, alone, all alone, alone. And what do single men do when they're all alone? Alone? What do you do, young man, when you're all alone? You, you, alone in a room with your ten chubby little fingers, all alone. Don't look at her, look at me, look at me. You know what you're doing. You're watching porn, you're having a wank. That's what you're doing! <laughs> I don't know about you, but I do not want to become the first woman in the world to become pregnant from a remote control. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me funny. I'm not saying I put them inside me. Accidents <laughs> do happen. Accidents! I like this job because I'm allowed to be sarcastic at work, you know, which I'm sure many of you do, but I'm contractually obligated to be <laughs> sarcastic at work. I used to do it in my old job. I remember I was like, oh, well done, Toby. That's a brilliant spaceship, you dick. <laughs> that is how I lost my job in the primary school, really. But, uh... It's weird. Sarcasm is very popular, isn't it, in this country? We go mental for it. We love sarcasm. We're, sometimes I think it's too popular. Sometimes I think it creeps into situations where it doesn't really belong. Like, I'll give you an example. Recently, I was at the dentist, and they had a poster in the waiting room, and it said, Question, do I have to floss between all of my teeth? <laughs> Answer, no, just the ones you want to keep. <laughs> I don't think sarcasm is appropriate <laughs> in a medical context, really. I mean, where do you draw the line with that? What if you're at the doctor's, at the GP in the waiting room, and there's a, a poster on the wall, and it says, Question, can I eat all the pies? <laughs> Answer, there, yeah, you carry on, you thick, fat prat. <laughs> that would be quite an aggressive campaign, wouldn't it? Although what's tragic is you wouldn't reel back in shock if you saw it in this country. You'd be like, oh, right, well, I'll lay off the parties then. <laughs> I've maxed out all my credit cards. I love the adverts on the radio for credit cards when the woman's really excited and she's like, get this credit card because it's brilliant and there's zero interest for nine long months and you can buy loads of stuff and you can go into absolute denial about debt and it might even make you come. And then... <laughs> And she goes, subject to availability, non fixed rate, variable APR, terms and conditions apply. Like, what did you just say then? <laughs> That's not a reasonable way of communicating, is it? That's, you wouldn't tolerate being spoken to in that manner in any other situation in your life. You wouldn't put up with it. You wouldn't put up with it if, for example, you were out on a date and you thought to yourself, this bloke's attractive. And he says to you, I think you're attractive and I am solvent. <laughs> And I've got absolutely no emotional baggage. But I will be intending to take up the arsenal not returning phone calls and erode self-confidence. <laughs> like, sorry, I didn't catch everything you said then. You, you gabbled a bit then at the end. Don't worry, darling, don't worry, sweetheart. Do you want another little glass of wine, something like that? Do hope you're going for a tip wank and I'll be recording it for training purposes. <laughs> 
that would be quite unsettling, wouldn't it? You know, initially. <laughs> Push through. <laughs> the other quite nice thing about this job is not only am I allowed to be sarcastic, I'm allowed to exaggerate. All comedians exaggerate. It's quite a comedic conceit to use exaggeration. And women are very good at exaggerating. Generally speaking, we're a lot better than men at it, I think, apart from the cock stuff. We're much better, <laughs> we're much better at exaggerating than men. Women are very good at just slightly overreacting to arguably trivial things. <laughs> We've got that covered. Like, you know when a woman puts her hand in her handbag to find her purse, but she doesn't immediately find her purse? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being funny. I'm going to have to cancel all of my cards now. And every... Oh, hang on, I found it. I found it. I hadn't checked the front pocket. What am I like? <laughs> You're like a prick. I am naturally much scruffier than this. I blame that at the moment on having a small child. Not even four years old, and he's already a massive sexist. <laughs> he is. All that trouble to get him out, and he is a sexist. The other day he went, Mummy, are you going to work again? <laughs> I said, yeah. And he went, why? <laughs> I said, well, for money, but also I love it. And he went, I'm going to come to your work, and I'm going to be the best at it. I said, oh, are you now? And he went, yeah, I can put my own coat on. <laughs> the other morning, I popped the radio on, thought we were having a nice bit of mum and son time, and he went, don't dance, mummy, not while I'm eating. <laughs> talking of what he was eating, talking of sexism, for about a year he called the breakfast cereal Weetabix, pick a bitch. I really want him to grow up to respect women, but I did nothing to correct him. <laughs> Just a lot more fun of a morning, isn't it? What do you want for breakfast? Um, pick a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> <You're like that. laughs> pick a bitch, please. <laughs> now, before I had him and I was still pregnant, over and over again I would say this to people. I don't care if I have a boy or a girl. I just want to have a strong daughter or a gentle son. <laughs> what a prick. <laughs> and it's karma for that smugness. I've got a very violent boy. <laughs> My ex-mother-in-law loves it because she gets to say to people, he's got his father's eyes and his mother's rage. And he has, he's got all of his rage from me, sadly. And I think it's a shame, because he is a boy, and I think it's a shame, generally, that in 2019, the vast majority of boys and men in the world still think that anger's the only emotion they're allowed. <laughs> it's just not, I, I desperately want him to be more complicated than that, obviously, but I don't know how to do it. I genuinely don't know how to do it. I, I certainly think there's an irony in how aggressive it sounds to say, I'm gonna gender neutralize you. <laughs> I basically, I constantly beg him to be kind. Uh, I try and encourage him to play with stuff that might make him more caring. And I dress him very colourfully, like a tiny timid mallet. <laughs> I don't think that's harming anyone, but I've met some opposition. I was walking down the street the other day with my kid. He happened to be wearing a top that had a glittery unicorn on it. I stopped to talk to a neighbour, not someone I know well, but they changed the days they were taking the bins and it was carnage. <laughs> So her and I are having a bit of bin chat, bin, 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 back and forth, bin chat, in the middle of a lovely bin chat, bin, 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 apropos and nothing, she clocks him and goes, what I don't understand is why people aren't bringing up boys to be proper men anymore. Why aren't people bringing up boys to be proper men? And what you can't sort of really say is, oh, I think we're just sort of tired of all the rape. <laughs> Some of you didn't like that. If you didn't like that, I hope it's not because you're not tired of all the rape. We are. <laughs> it's a big word, I get it. It is a big word. But it is all about context language, I think. Now that my son can speak, I'm having to be more careful than ever about what I say. And, and, and my lexicon is a mess. I pick up bits of language, little phrases and sayings off people. I don't know where they've come from. I don't necessarily think about them until I'm called on it. For years, I used the phrase over and over again. I'd say to people, ah, oh, come on, grow a pair. 
come on. And he's like, get braver, get stronger. Oh, come on, grow a pair. I was saying it everywhere. And it turns out the phrase is actually about um, um, balls. <laughs> Not nipples. <laughs> I don't know how much time you've ever spent with the thought, but testicles, um, do you know the ones I mean? <laughs> they are across the whole of the known universe where anyone can communicate, they are accepted as a symbol of power, strength, and bravery. <laughs> How has that happened when they have the potential to be licked too hard? <laughs> I've met a braver ice cream. <laughs> they shy away from a chilly breeze. <laughs> doing that, would you? What's that? It's cold outside. I'm joining in! <laughs> Arguably looking my best! <laughs> and conversely, all the language we have for weakness is just as screwed up. If someone's done something cowardly, we call them a pussy. Excuse me, that is not a cowardly part of the anatomy, thank you very much. Even if it hasn't been through childbirth, which if it has, it's been through more than the character Carrie in the film Carrie. <laughs> Even if it hasn't been through that, most of them are pretty brave on account of the adult lifetime of ineptitude that they will have endured. <laughs> and if you're thinking, actually, that's from the Latin pusillanimous, yes, technically you'd be correct, but it is all about context, isn't it? And when Ian's leaning out of his white van and shouting, pussy, I don't think that's what he means. <laughs> Someone's done something weak, we call them a chicken. You can cut a chicken's head off and it can still walk. <laughs> the worst one, though, if someone's done something unstrong, we call them a weed. I, I don't know if there's any gardeners in. <laughs> Weeds are the strongest bastard I've ever met. There's a weed called Japanese knotweed. You can cut it into a hundred little bits, put it inside a plastic bag. It gets back out the plastic bag. This is a plant. It hasn't even got a face. Gets back out the plastic bag, meets back up with its mates, botanical term. Gets back down into the ground, reroots. It's so strong, so powerful, that it breaks up the foundations of buildings and destroys the value of property. Weeds can bring down capitalism, guys! <laughs> and I'd like to see a pair of gonads do that. <laughs> She's like, Ashley, just try and get out of the house and maybe do some exercise. Build up your strength and your muscle. Do a bit of exercise. But I actually find it highly offensive that my mother would suggest that I do exercise because she knows that I actually suffer from a terrible disability which prevents me from doing any exercise, which is where I can't... Um, I can't... Uh, be arsed! I can't be arsed. <laughs> I just kind of can't be. And I would love to be into exercise and stuff, but I just can't be arsed, I'll be honest. <laughs> and, and, you know, people... I did um, uh, get tricked into going to Pilates class because I thought it was pronounced pilots. And I was there for about 15 minutes going, I wonder when they're going to let us fly the planes. <laughs> um, my friend Brona suggested that I do something social, like ping-pong table tennis. Ping pong. I mean, I just, the ball moves too fast. I can never see it. To me, ping pong just looks like two perverts spanking a ghost. <laughs> just don't understand it. Do you know what I get a buzz out of? Sitting down. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I love sitting down. I do. I love sitting down. I even tried to do this gig sitting down, but they said they couldn't legally classify it as stand up. Hi <laughs> Um, but yes, I really do love sitting down. You know the way you always hear those stories in the tabloids about those men who were found sat down in a chair, dead and alone, and they hadn't been found for days, and they were sat there covered in their own wee. Oh, no. What those stories never mention is the smile on that man's face. <laughs> but my mother, uh, my mother said to me, she was like, Ashley, if you don't start doing exercise, then you could end up becoming fat thin. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, Mary and Joseph and all of his carpenter friends. <laughs> what is fat thin? Oh, Ashling, I read about it in a women's magazine. A women's magazine. The only targets of women's magazines are other women. Fat thin is where you're thin, but you're secretly fat because you don't do any exercise. 
You can also be thin fat, fat fat, thin thin, too fat, too thin, thin in the wrong place, thin in the right place, fat in the wrong place, fat in the right place. But no matter what you do, no matter what you try, you are definitely wrong. <laughs> If I don't have enough problems in my life trying to walk down the street at night and not get raped, trying to live in a society where 25-year-old women are sticking plastic and poison in their faces, so by the time they get to their 40s and 50s, they've nothing left to do to themselves but pull out their eyeballs and stick babies' eyeballs in instead. <laughs> the even worse, where it's a tragedy to die young, so we're all pumped full of stuff to make us live longer, but nobody wants to do anything as unnatural as look older. Oh, no, would not be mad to look older and be older. So we're all pumped full of stuff to make us live longer, but look younger, so by the time we we died 100 in a box, we look like we've died tragically young. That we live in a world where they have developed telephones without plugs that can send a picture of a cat from one side of the world to the other side of the world in under a second. And they are still trying to go up with faster telephones. Yet still, after 200,000 years of humanity, we have not come up with a better way to have a baby child than to push something the size of a bowling ball out my tiny hole! <laughs> I said, go shove it up your fluke, mother. <laughs> I didn't actually tell my mother to go and shove it up her fluke. Um, I agreed to go to a Zumba class. <laughs> I'll just hold my hands together like this. You will, and no, I'll let them go. to do it here now? Yes, I think they're liking it. OK, what would you like? Can I do my galoon noddling? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, have you got a galoon? Yes, I have. What are the chances? <laughs> there you go. Oh, lovely. OK, I'll just stretch it out. Have you got a pump? Yes, I've got a pump. Hand it over. There you go. <laughs> Simply put it, put it in like that. Insert it. Don't look at me doing this. Oh, here it goes! <laughs> I just fill it up like this. That's amazing. All the way. Wow, that's really long. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I'm crazy. Me. Anything could happen. Watch and learn, Pa. 
Monty, you watch your moan. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm tying it in a knot. <laughs> I only go out with Irish guys, right? I sometimes do a Narva. Oh, they're great, aren't they? Sometimes do Narva and Irish as a palate cleanser, but it's not the same. Because <laughs> I love how dirty their accents are, but once you get them in bed, they're all, what's going on, miss? Oh. <laughs> Just like farmers in a porno or something. They've got <laughs> this sexual purity about them that is mwah. I was pumping this Irish guy once and he started coming out with all this dirty talk and I was like, ugh, this one's broken. <laughs> that so distasteful. <laughs> the flip side of that innocence is they can be very misogynistic and the last time I was in Northern Ireland, I was with a female friend and a strunk guy for no reason, Cat called us, and he shouted at us, I chag you up the arse and I chag her up the arse. <laughs> And I was so offended, but then I thought, oh yeah, you'd have to in Northern Ireland because you still don't have legal abortion. <laughs> <laughs> don't be going, oi, 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 we've got legal access to it in this country. In Northern Ireland, they just have to pretend they love boat trips to Liverpool forever. <laughs> What's that, Jenny? Off to Liverpool again, fourth time this year. <laughs> I just love the Beatles Museum. I only go out with Irish guys and I don't date outside my class. I never date outside my class. I don't care if you think this is judgmental. Maybe you think that love crosses all boundaries. What about Kate Winslet and him out of Titanic? Well, I'll tell you what happens at the end of Titanic. The poor person drowns because the rich person is hogging all the resources. <laughs> there was room on that wardrobe door for two and she just let him slip off and drown in the sea. Dating outside your class don't work. I've done it before. I went to a very posh university. I went to Edinburgh. Don't know if you know it. It's like Hogwarts. There's a lot of specky virgins and a lot of insufferable rich people. <laughs> now, I went out with a posh guy. I'm not having a go at posh English people. If any of you are in, I love how jolly you are. I love your limitless sense of entitlement. You're great. Posh Scottish people are the worst. They hate other Scottish people. I went with a posh Scottish guy. Should have known he was posh, because first off, his name was Lyle. <laughs> no one where I'm from in Scotland has names like Lyle. I'm from a town called Bathgate, where everyone looks like they've been carved out of boiled ham and rolled around in stubble. <laughs> Men and women. If you're a boy in my town, you get one of three names. You're called John, Paul, or John Paul. <laughs> Good Catholic names. <laughs> I feel really self-conscious in heels at this gig. I don't like wearing heels at gigs because uh, I'm a pretty tall woman and I want, it was hard telling you I was bisexual earlier, but I also want to tell you I'm in an even more taboo relationship than that. I'm in a tolly, smally couple, right? <laughs> My boyfriend is tit height, shoulder height when he wears his little walking boots, which he sometimes does for a treat. <laughs> it's awkward being this tall, man. There's a lot of tally smally couples in Scotland. Um, I mean, I get off a train at home, I feel like I've stepped in at Gulliver's Travels. <laughs> but why is that child smoking? Oh, no, no, it's one of Glasgow's tiny wizened men. <laughs> And I get mistaken for a guy a lot at home, and I didn't realise this was happening initially. Like, I got called sir in the supermarket, and I just thought, finally, people are showing me the respect I deserve. <laughs> a big hands for a biological woman. Look at the size of that man. Big hands! My boyfriend feels like he's being wanked off by a roofer. <laughs> Sometimes we incorporate this into role play where I'm Snow White and he's one of the seven dwarves left alone. <laughs> Grumpy, if anyone's wondering. We expect too much on products these days, we really do. We expect ridiculous things on products. I picked up a thing the other day, I found, I found in a pharmacy the other day, stress relieving shampoo. <laughs> Think about that combination of words, stress relieving shampoo. I mean, I understand the words individually. You put them together, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, does it? At what point does a hair cleanser become the answer to your stresses as a human being 
tossed about in a daily sea of shit. <laughs> when do you suggest to a mate that they use stress-relieving shampoo? That's at what point do you wait for them to come up to you and go, oh, so, so, it's all gone tits up, mate. <laughs> Wife's uh, left me, the kids hate me. <laughs> Business has gone under, I'm gonna lose the house, I'm drinking too much. <laughs> I can't see myself carrying on. <laughs> Is it at that point? As a responsible mate, you interject with, mate, can't be that bad. <laughs> Have you thought about using <laughs> some eucalyptus and spearmint stress-relieving shampoo? <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether it can help you with a divorce. You might need a conditioner for that, but it's... <laughs> It's worth a try, isn't it? <laughs> when you start looking at the wording in adverts, then you start to realise what nonsense they are. Even, even second-hand adverts, things with second-hand products. I was, I was online the other night looking for a, for a second-hand car, right? I was using a well-known internet website looking for a second-hand car. I found a car I was interested in, had a little picture of the car, all the stats you'd need, all the information about the car, all the figures you'd need, right? But then in addition to that, it had along the side just a little tagline. It just said, one lady owner. I thought, what, what does that actually mean? <laughs> what are they trying to say? One lady owner. What they're trying to say is that you, you're going to be buying a slightly better car, because it's been owned by a lady, but it doesn't actually make any sense, that does it? You just think, surely it depends on who the lady was. Just a lady. It's just a lady. <laughs> I'm just suggesting if it was Bodicea, the alloys might be slightly knackered, that's all. <laughs> It's the word lady as well in there that really grates with me. Lady, it makes it just sound like we all just drive around in bonnets, doesn't it, girls? With white gloves with a freshly baked Battenberg steaming away on the passenger seat beside us. As an overly friendly Yorkshire Terrier bounces up and down playfully in the window. We listen to opera on a cassette driving like a lady. You know. It's bullshit, and I can tell you that for a fact, because when I sell the car that I own at the moment, I can legitimately use the strap line one lady owner, and I'll tell you exactly what that means. It means last month, I drove it for half an hour with a handbrake on. That's what that means. <laughs> half an hour. Half an hour. We've all done five minutes. <laughs> half an hour's resisting any information the car is trying to give you, isn't it? <laughs> I managed to convince myself I was driving behind a mobile barbecue. I was like, what a smoky smoky. <laughs> I do make assumptions, like people come up to me and assume that I'm friendly and helpful. Uh, <laughs> fat people hate your skinny asses, okay? Like, we would punch you all in your skinny ass mouths if we weren't too fat to run away immediately afterward. <laughs> it's the only thing protecting any of you guys. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you guys, like, giving up, you know, because I feel like this is my life, I, this is my experience, I should get to talk about it. Because, you know, who we love hearing talking about being fat is really skinny people. Oh, it's their favorite thing. And all women will recognize this. Guys, you may not know this, but in the ladies' toilets, if you ever walk in, there's always at least two gorgeous women there who are friends playing their favorite game to play together, which is which one of us has the lower self-esteem? Let's find out. <laughs> all right, and here's how the game works. There'll be two women, right, you know, in the mirror, dressed to the nines, shirt here, skirt there, putting on more makeup, and one says to the other one, like, oh my God, I love that top. And she's like, five quid, Cry, Marnie! Ah! <laughs> Just take the compliment, bitch. Okay, fine. And so, so then she's like, I, I love your skirt. Oh my God, your ass looks amazing in that skirt. I would totally tap that ass if I had a dick. Totally. <laughs> you know? And then she's like, what are you talking about? I hate my ass. It's huge and disgusting. Oh, I had salad and breadsticks for dinner. I want to choke. <laughs> The other one's like, what are you talking about? Look at this, this is disgusting, look at this. And the other one's like, look at this, this is revolting, look at this. And she's like, look at this! <laughs> <laughs> then you'll be there, right, in the background, having the audacity to be both fat and live, somehow, day to day. <laughs> Make it through, right? And they eventually notice you there in the mirror, and they're like, your hair is so sassy, or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, are these the same women who would be standing next to Stephen Hawking? Like, oh my God, I cannot move. Oh, I'm so lazy. Oh. <laughs> Isn't it 
intense amount of ego you have there, lady, because seriously, you know, I, whether you think you're way worse than everyone else or way better than everyone else, you still think you're different to anybody else? Like, we're all pretty much like the same asshole with seven different versions of a face, right? We know that, right? <laughs> so you're not better or worse, but like, typically in our society, women tend to think that they're way worse than they are, and guys tend to think they're way better than they are. <laughs> like, Matrix, like, whoa, that's a lot of ego, bro. Um, <laughs> You know, and you can tell when they're chatting you up because they're always talking to you about all these things that they have. They're, you know, like, oh yeah, you know, I can totally get us tickets to that Kanye show, you used to know his manager, and like, yeah, I got a new Audi 5. You know, like, yeah, I got a time show, you should come up. And the more and more he's talking to you about all these things he can do for you, the smaller and smaller his dick gets in your imagination, right? <laughs> it's like this reverse Pinocchio where it's like every time he tells a lie, just, you know, you know. To the point at which you're like, dude, this guy has got like four inches of dick max <laughs> if you measure from the asshole. Because I'm not sure about having kids right now, so it means I'm very aware of my contraception. So I've done all the research for you. So the pill, 99% effective. Condoms, 99% effective. Eating a large Indian takeaway and then going, oh, look how pregnant I look. 100% <laughs> effective. <laughs> But my view on kids actually helped me become a little bit of an internet sensation earlier this year. There was a thing on Facebook, I don't know if you saw it, it was called the Motherhood Challenge. So it's where mums were putting up five photos of themselves that made them proud to be a mother. So there were pictures of like little Ken on the beach, little Ken trying to have a cardo for the first time, <laughs> little Ken asking, what kind of a name is Ken for a toddler? <laughs> lovely, lovely. Now I do not have a problem with anyone being proud to be a parent. I just saw a lot of this stuff, thought I'm going to do the opposite. I did the non-motherhood challenge. I posted five photos of myself that made me proud not to be a mother. Four of those were pictures of me asleep. <laughs> and the fifth one was of me asleep holding a bottle of wine. <laughs> really, really silly, right? Whacked it up on Facebook, didn't really think any more about it. For some reason, it went bananas, right? It went viral, got shared a gazillion times, went all the way around the world. At one point, I became Woman of the Week on a Swahili parenting blog. <laughs> and it was really interesting seeing the different responses. I got back to it. So the first lot of people to write on my Facebook page were women like me without children, saying things like, oh, Ellie, thanks for giving us the childless a voice. I was like, no worries, babes, you're welcome. <laughs> and then I got some other replies, and I printed them out here. So um, I got some replies from some mothers. So that was quite interesting. Um, like this lady, we'll call her um, mummy number one. She said, um, you don't understand what it feels like to become a mother, you fucking superficial basic bitch. <laughs> Mummy number one. So maternal, isn't she? <laughs> then what happened is other childless women started defending me against the cross mums. So like, there was this lady who piped up, very angry. We'll call her outraged from Kent. She said, why is this funny? Don't mock the ones who choose to be parents. Very tasteless. So then an American lady came into my rescue. Now see if you can work out why I think she's American. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, woman! <laughs> no one owes you an explanation. Nobody has time for another butt-hurt mommy. <laughs> Outrage from Kent comes back rather sensibly with, what on earth is a butt-hurt mommy? <laughs> Nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> then other cross mums started replying to me, but these mums were from different countries, so they were insulting me in different languages. <laughs> Don't worry, guys, Facebook translates it for us, so we didn't miss out. <laughs> so there was this lady from Mexico. Uh, now, when, when it says it, I think it means she. No wonder it does not have children. <laughs> Look at its big teeth. <laughs> I 
Gracias, amigo, Mexico. <laughs> but this was all saved in the end by the final group who replied to me, and they made everything better. They were led by a man called Alessandro. And Alessandro says, as an Italian, I need to know what kind of wine is that? <laughs> From life we do like we don't want kids right now people think that when you say you don't want kids it's because you hate kids and I don't hate kids I just don't trust me to keep one alive different thing <laughs> and you know bringing up kids in this country now we don't know what's gonna happen with brexit is happening now we just got to deal with it whatever you voted we don't know what's gonna happen I mean I just think why on earth did we have that referendum if you know who your regional MEP is then you are your regional MEP <laughs> get their heads around me not wanting children. They really can't get their heads around it at all. I, uh, I went to see my doctor a couple of years ago about something completely unrelated. And he said to me, you do know, Angela, don't you? you do know, if you were to have a child now, you'd be what we call a geriatric mother. <laughs> He's dead now, so. <laughs> he said, why don't you get some eggs frozen? He said, why don't you freeze some eggs? And if you change your mind, they're there, you can use them. You know? And I thought about it, I really thought about it. And then I thought, do you know what? Every time I've frozen something, it's gone a bit shit. Right? <laughs> Do I want my children to be the human equivalent of a ready meal? <laughs> what about when little Findus and Sarah Lee go off to school? <laughs> when they get taught about the birds and the bees, they're going to get taken into a separate room and get told your mum went to Iceland. No. <laughs> People can't get their heads around it. They say things to me like, who's going to look after you when you get old? It's not why you have kids, is it? Doesn't seem right. I mean, I know we have to worry about these things, you know, because we're all living longer, aren't we? There are so many hundred-year-olds in this country now, the Queen's had to get a moon pig account to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> I find it weird that people think it's OK to ask you about your reproductive choices. It's a private question, isn't it? It's asking you about your sex life, essentially. And also, I'm 40 and I don't have any children. There could be a really awkward or upsetting answer to that question, couldn't there? Why would you ask anyone a question that could have an awkward or upsetting answer? You wouldn't ask someone why they're bald, <laughs> would you? You wouldn't ask a couple from Norfolk how they're related, right? <laughs> Questions seem to be small talk. I want to make it awkward when they ask me. I want to say to them, oh, I had a baby, but I ate it. <laughs> there are loads of reasons for not having kids, and people can't under People get angry with me, so angry, because I don't want to have... Often, the people who get most angry with me for not wanting to have children are the same people that are angry about high levels of immigration in this country. Well, are we full up or not? Pick a team. <laughs> Last year, Katie Hopkins wrote an article in the Daily Mail in which she said that childless women were odd and lacked a human connection. Katie Hopkins <laughs> thinks that I lack a human connection. That is like being called racist by also Katie Hopkins. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting old. Old people can do what they like. You see, any old person, they do what they like. I got on the bus the other day, this incredibly old woman got on, she went straight up to this guy who was sitting down and said, how old are you? This guy was like, 37. She said, I'm 84, get up. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, she just invented human top trumps. <laughs> this guy missed a trick, he should have demanded another round, be like, all right, old lady, uh, what's your top speed? <laughs> no chance. I think the worst thing about having a baby, uh, without a doubt, the worst thing about the whole pregnancy, I'd say even more painful than labour was telling my parents that I was pregnant. Because <laughs> my parents never talked to me about sex. They just never did that. I mean, to be fair on them, I think they operated on a need-to-know basis, and given I had a head brace till I was 17, they thought, do you know what? She doesn't need to know. <laughs> But I swear, I knew nothing about sex as a teenager. I think the closest I came to having sex at that time was when I was doing lengths in a local pool and a man accidentally butterflied over me. <laughs> 
I mean, I lost my virginity so late in the end that when it finally happened, I wasn't so much deflowered as deadheaded. <laughs> but I wish I was sexually confident, like in my 20s. Love to be like that. Love to be a player. You know what I'm talking about? We all know people like this, people who are going to go like, I'm going to go out tonight and I'm going to get laid. I would love to be like that. I'd love to be the sort of person who could just walk into any nightclub with my towel. <laughs> like Gold Duke of Venom award-winning piece of ass right here. <laughs> strippers. It's another person. I, weirdly, I kind of admire strippers. I would love to be like a stripper. I would love to just be able to stand on stage and own it, like know I was sexy. That would be awesome, you know? I would be the world's worst lap dancer. I could not sit on a man's knee and not want to make giddy up noises. <laughs> and strip joints, they're designed to be alluring. I challenge anyone in this room, even if you agree with them or not, to walk past a strip joint and a bit of you is not like, oh my God. What's happening? Because they've got like the blacked out windows and the bouncers on the door. There's always a bit of you that's like, oh my God, what are they doing in there? And it's exactly the same feeling as when I was a kid and I used to walk past the school staff room. <laughs> you walk past you and be like, oh man, what is happening in there? I mean, it turns out both are full of adults whose lives didn't work out as planned. <laughs> The thing I find the weirdest about strip joints, if you've ever been to one, everywhere you go, all these big signs, do not touch the women! Please do not touch the ladies! The strippers always say, the fact that the men can't touch us, that's what makes our job really empowering. And I always think, well, that's not really empowering, is it? Because that's the same rule in every other workplace in the country. <laughs> shop and it says, welcome to Tesco's, don't finger the staff. Being poor has not stopped people shopping. I know that because I live in Tooting, where people have not let being very deprived stop them from dressing badly in a different way every day. Right. There is a fashion trend in my area where women wear t-shirts with more attractive women on them. So, like, there'll be acne-ridden schoolgirls emblazoned with Debbie Harry in her heyday. Very big women with Kate Moss riding around on their pendulous breasts. <laughs> and very old women, the kind that have been betrayed twice by their follicles, wearing both five o'clock shadow and a wig. <laughs> and then have Rihanna grinding down on them inappropriately. <laughs> when I first noticed this, I thought, these women cannot be well served by the comparison. Like if a gentleman was like, oh, hello, we, ugh. <laughs> but then I remembered that men are stupid. <laughs> and actually they will find anything alluring if you put a sexy woman on it. That's the basis of all advertising ever. Like, these t-shirts are probably tricking men into having threesomes. <laughs> like, oh yeah, it's a great light last night. It was me, pop star Rihanna, and a really old lady who was bald with a beard. <laughs> Facial hair thing terrifies me. I'm setting up a charity um, which is going to be where young women go into hospitals and pluck the faces of old women for them. <laughs> it's going to be called Dignitash. I remember having a time where I felt really low, really bad about myself. And there was no particular reason, right? Because nobody had died, everything was going well. Like, seemingly on paper, things were good. Like, my local Chinese buffet started serving crispy aromatic duck before 6 pm. Things were going all right. <laughs> I had to do something, right? Because I was crying constantly. Like, I couldn't stop crying. Like, I'd masturbate and I'd cry. <laughs> Who does that? You don't get guys having a wank, do you? Being like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know what to do anymore. I don't understand it anymore. What do I do with myself? you do it in the face like that, is it? <laughs> it's 
So I started taking the antidepressants, right? And the weirdest thing happened. I stopped crying. I was like, what? I was like, Mum? Mum? I'm not crying. John Lewis advert is on, I'm not crying. And I hated it. I was like, well, I've got to make myself cry. Forget this, I've got to make myself cry if it kills me. So I did everything in my power to make myself cry. So I know what I did. Do I hear it? That's what I did. I went home and I put on the Lion King. Mm. <laughs> oh, we all know what bit. We all know what bit. Don't we? A bit where Simba comes along and he's like, Dad, Dad, come on, you gotta get up! <laughs> These drugs are good. <laughs> it didn't last long. I just went on right move and looked at property prices in the 1990s and it was like, ah! <laughs> But my parents, I, I don't want to go into my childhood here because it's wrong. My parents hated me, okay? We're all going to hear the story, aren't we? When my parents hated me too. My parents, all I ever heard, all I ever heard growing up is, why can't you be like your cousin Sheila? Why can't you be like your cousin Sheila? Sheila had died at birth. They just <laughs> hated me. They, whenever we go like in front of a street, they'd take, each parent would take my hand, hold our hand, we're crossing the street, and then they'd swing me into the traffic. <laughs> and was, they used to say, take candy from strangers. And it's, <laughs> Ask the funny man in the raincoat, does he own a van? It is just... <laughs> no, I, I had a very bad childhood, and that's because, and I'm sure none of you give a damn, but I was the only Jewish kid, this is the absolute truth, growing up in an all-Catholic neighborhood. You know what that's? The Irish people. Only Jewish kid in a Catholic neighborhood. You know what that's like? You were all doing Hail Marys, I was doing Hail Murrays. I mean, it was just... <laughs> no Christmas tree? No Christmas tree. Do you know what that's like when you're the only kid without a Christmas tree? Because everybody has Christmas trees. And nowadays, it's like, well, we do it for all faiths. That's such bullshit. Yeah, we walk into, a, into a, uh, an office building, and there's a Christmas tree, and there's a Renora. Bullshit! The Christmas tree goes up, 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 There's like a little shitty menorah with two orange lights and some angry Puerto Ricans lit backwards. I mean, uh, yes! <laughs> Juan, you lit those lights backwards. Fuck you, you killed our Lord. I mean, it is just... So, I'm at the age where I figured, screw it, I'm gonna have a Christmas tree. I got the biggest Christmas tree in... I got a two-story high Christmas tree. I put everything you could think of on that... Up, 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 gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. On the bottom, I got the, the manger, I got the whole goddamn thing going there, the wise men, the sheep. And the only thing is, I have the baby, but I'm Jewish, I got him a nanny. It was just a mess. <laughs> and I redressed Mary. She didn't look good. That stupid thing over her head, come on. I put her in a Chanel suit, <laughs> Manolo Blahnix, and a Louis Vuitton pocketbook. You're the mother of God. Look it. It is just... <laughs> Am I wrong? If she had looked like that, she would have gotten into the inn. Yes. <laughs> the point is, it's about looks. Mary, she looked good. She would have done better. Mother Teresa, <laughs> oh. Oh, don't give me, oh, Mother Teresa, if she had looked better, she'd be a saint by now. <laughs> Was she a bow wow? Yes, sir. did she need electrolysis? Let's talk to each other here. <laughs> Even lepers were throwing their fingers at her. Here, get the Because <laughs> it is all about looks. This is my message, Great Britain. This is my message. Looks count, education, <laughs> looks count. <laughs> I have no sex appeal, and it has screwed me up for life. Peeping Toms, look in my window, pull down the shade. You have, you have no idea. My gynecologist examines me by telephone. It is just... 